Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here with Henry. Hello. And we're sporting our New York Rangers jerseys. Yes. I got the jersey that's signed with autographs from members of the 1994 Stanley Cup champion Rangers team. Henry's got his Artemi Panarin jersey. We're big Ranger fans, mm -hmm. excited that they're in the playoffs, and we're showing our support. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of ironic because today we're actually covering a guy who was governor of the state of New York. So a lot of New York ties. We're also really excited because today is our next Vice, Vice Presidential President Series installment. And we're taking a look at what number, Henry? The 44th Vice President of the United States, Nelson Rockefeller. That's right. The 41st Vice President of the United States, Nelson Rockefeller. Got some cool things to tell you about Rockefeller, but first... Before we get into our 41st Vice President, Henry, what do people need to do? Hit subscribe down below, leave all your comments and questions, give, give a like, and hit that little note. You got it. Down. Hit subscribe down below, leave all those comments and questions, hit the like and the thumbs up, notification bell so you can be notified when we release a new video, which is usually every single week. Every single week, he's right. Usually. 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 So here we go. Next Vice Presidential Series installment. 41st Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, and this is Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you here with Henry. Hello. Yep, and the guy behind us, the 41st Vice President of the United States. What's his name, Henry? Nelson Rockefeller. Nelson Rockefeller. And you kind of know the name Rockefeller. Why? Because a bunch of people are named Rockefeller. Well, yes, that's true. But also, where do you go in New York City to see the Christmas tree during Christmas? Um, Ra Rockefeller um, Center. Center. Rockefeller Center. That's right. You got it. You, you know it. So there you go. And some big news for us, this is actually our last Vice Presidential Series installment video. This is it. The series is over for now. For, for now, now. For now. Because we're not going to do a Walter Mondale video just yet because... He's not dead. Well, he is dead. He died last year, but he's not buried anywhere. He was cremated, but they didn't bury him. So, you know, of course, this being dead history, we like yeah. to look at the burial sites. But speaking of that... There's something very interesting about Mr. Rockefeller's gravesite. Mm. One I've never actually personally visited. Yeah. In fact, only one person I know has ever seen it. It's on private Rockefeller family property. We're going to tell you all about it. It's going to be interesting. Some other cool things about Rockefeller. Of course, everybody knows the Rockefeller name. Richest family in American history, the Rockefellers. Really? He came from wealth. He came from power, prominence, yes. And he was also four times the governor of the state of New York. So Nelson Rockefeller, really interesting guy. We're going to get into it. We're going to get into his unusual death and his very private gravesite. We're going to get into all that. So they did the likes. Let's see. They did the subscribes, comments, questions, notification. Well, they did it all, Henry. So now for our final Vice Presidential Series video, what do they got to go get? Go get the popcorn, the pretzels, the potato chips, the soda. All of it, right? All of it. All of it. Whatever you like to snack yeah. on, go get it. Because here we go. Taking a look at the 41st Vice President, Nelson Rockefeller. Here at Dead History, this has been a lot of fun, this Vice Presidential Series. Stay tuned. A lot to come from yeah. Dead History from Henry and I. Here we go. Sit back. Relax. Relax and enjoy. And enjoy. Hey guys, welcome. TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment as we're taking a look at the 41st Vice President of the United States, Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. Yeah, Nelson Rockefeller, it's hard to believe. We're already up to number 41, but here we are. So a couple things I do want to touch on before we jump into our 41st Vice President, Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, a couple uh, quick things here. So I feel like uh, it's been so long since I've 
spoke to you guys, to uh, our audience here, to our uh, fans and followers and subscribers, uh, the reality is it's only been a little over a week, maybe a week and a half, but it seems like it's been forever. Um, we did take last week off. Uh, I know I've been pretty quiet and silent on my social media, my Instagram and such. A uh, lot's been going on in uh, our life, uh, Henry and I. Um, so, you know, we just have a lot going on. Nothing serious, nothing uh, anybody needs to be alarmed about. Uh, just uh, typical life. Life sometimes gets in the way of uh, things that we like to do and hobbies and such. And uh, that's just the way it goes. Uh, not only do I work full time, but I take care of Henry full time. And then uh, we have baseball. I have baseball four to five days a week. Uh, and that includes weekends, usually two weeknights, uh, Saturday and Sunday. And usually it's more like three weeknights. So uh, I usually only have about two days off a week from baseball on top of working full time and everything else. So uh, it, it's it's a lot. Uh, just a lot going on. Very, very busy. And then I was all pumped up this week. Let's jump right in. Let's do our vice president video. And as of Sunday of this week, so a few days ago, uh, I've been sick. You could probably still hear it in my voice that I'm congested still. So I came down with, you know, a nice sinus infection or cold, you know, a stuffy nose and sore throat and all that stuff. So uh, the timing could not be worse. Uh, but I wanted to get this video out. Uh, and another thing I want to touch on, uh, I think this is going to be our last vice presidential series of video. Uh, I know you guys are like, wait a minute. What about Walter Mondale? Um, I don't think I'm actually going to do Walter Mondale. Uh, I've debated about it a lot. Uh, today, uh, doing Nelson Rockefeller, believe it or not, I've never visited his grave site. But there's a reason for that, which you guys will find out. There's actually only one person I know that has ever been lucky and fortunate enough to visit his grave site. So uh, we'll get into that here in a little bit. Uh, but as far as Walter Mondale goes, there's still no grave site. There's no, uh, he was cremated. We do know that, of course. That's 100% factual. He was cremated. Uh, but there's no... You know, he, he no site. There's no internment site. There's no grave site for Walter Mondale. Uh, so, really, I feel like it's almost cheating to do a dead history video when we're not going to be taking a look at a grave site of someone. I understand that he is passed. He did die last year, uh, but uh, there's no grave site to go visit. And the whole purpose of these videos, as you guys know, is to not only inform you of the people, but it's also to show you the death, uh, you know, to show you their grave site, to show you things that, you know, here's where they lived, all that kind of thing. And when I don't have anything like that to show you, it kind of really does contradict our whole dead history, uh, you know, name so and brand, so to speak. So I, I think I'm going to hold off on a Walter Mondale video for now. It doesn't mean I'm never going to do one. It doesn't mean that I won't revisit it eventually. But for now, this is going to be our final vice presidential series installment uh, with Nelson Rockefeller. So it's hard to believe this series is coming to an end. Uh, and then some people have asked me, well, what's next? What are we going to do next? And to be honest, it's that's kind of a loaded question. What's next? Uh, we are definitely 100% going to do a uh, Declaration of Independence Signers series. So that will be next, Declaration of Independence Signers, which same format as we, we've always done. We're going to basically uh, do a new Declaration Signer each week. So each week we'll, we will look at a different signer. We will look at their legacy and their life. And then, of course, their gravesite and their death and all that sort of thing. Now, the original plan was to launch that series um, on July 4th. I was going to put out the first Declaration Signer Series video on July 4th of this year. Like, I thought it would be fitting. 
but I'm not sure I'm going to do that. It might be more toward September or October. The reason being, uh, I think that we just need a little bit of a break, uh, Henry and I. We, we, we're just constantly going, and right now, from now until sometime, sometime in July, we're going to be doing nothing but baseball almost nonstop. So um, we just have a lot going on in that regard, and I feel like if I try to rush a series out there, uh, it's not going to be beneficial for anyone, including myself. Uh, so, uh, plus, I also am working on a new logo, uh, a new logo that would be launched for the Declaration uh, Signers series. So, you know, working on all this kind of stuff, um, I think it's probably best that I don't promise you guys July 4th and we just kind of see what happens. Um, maybe it will be July 4th, but I think more than likely it's going to be the fall. Uh, also, over this summer, uh, I am going to be working on a website. I am going to be working on a website and eventually launching a website showing all of the grave sites that I visited, not just presidential and vice presidential, all the different uh, grave sites that I have visited over time and continue to. So uh, definitely going to be working on that as well. So a lot of things coming up. Uh, it's just I can't give you an exact timetable. Now, I will tell you this, that next week we have a live stream coming up with Dr. Thomas Belsersky, where we're going to be grading the vice presidents. Thomas and I will both be giving grades to all the vice presidents, so that's going to be awesome. And then in a couple weeks, I will be doing a live stream with Kurt Dion of KurtsHistoricSites.com where we're going to be grading the vice president grave sites, just like we graded the presidential grave sites. So a lot of fun. There's definitely stuff coming up and down the pike. And I'm sure in June, I definitely will do something. Maybe, not saying definite, but maybe even another trivia night. Who knows? We will see. So uh, keep all that in mind. Definitely a lot happening. But I wanted to give you guys the update. Uh, everything is fine on our end. Henry and I are both fine, except for my little cold right now. Uh, nothing is serious or bad. Uh, just, you know, some life things, personal things, work, school, baseball, all that stuff gets in the way sometimes. And, uh, you know, sometimes we have to obviously put our focus on those things rather than uh, these enjoyable things that we like to do. So just wanted to give you guys an update because I felt you deserve it. And that's pretty much it. So let's go. Let's jump right in here to our last part one, for now at least, of our vice presidential series as we're going to take a look at the 41st vice president, Nelson Rockefeller, his early life, his rise in politics, and leading up all the way to his vice presidency. So here we go. Let's take a look. I've known all the vice presidents since... Henry Wallace. They were all frustrated, and some were pretty bitter. Nelson Rockefeller. Television cameras that had been installed in the Senate chamber to cover the expected impeachment trial of President Richard M. Nixon were used instead to broadcast the swearing-in of Nelson A. Rockefeller as vice president on December 19th of 1974. A year earlier, Gerald Ford had chosen to take his oath as vice president in the House chamber where he had served as Republican floor leader. Rockefeller might have opted for a White House ceremony but decided to take the oath in the chamber where he would preside as president of the Senate. With President Gerald Ford attending and Chief Justice Warren Burger administering the oath, Rockefeller became the nation's second appointed vice president. After the brief ceremony, the cameras were switched off. Not until 1986 would Senate proceedings be televised on a regular basis. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. 
I, Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. I, Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. On which I am about to enter. On which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. A family of wealth and power. Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller came to the vice presidency boasting a remarkable pedigree. His maternal grandfather, Rhode Island Senator Nelson Aldrich, had been the Senate's most powerful member at the turn of the century. Aldrich chaired the Senate Finance Committee and played the key role in passage of tariffs that influenced every industry and agricultural pr product. In 1901, Aldrich's daughter, Abby, married John D. Rockefeller Jr., son of the nation's wealthiest man, the founder of Standard Oil. Although they combined political power and corporate wealth, the reputations of Nelson Aldrich and John D. Rockefeller Sr. were less than stellar. In a series of articles for Cosmopolitan magazine during 1906, muckraking journalist David Graham Phillips portrayed Aldrich as a corrupt boss who contributed to the treason, treason of the Senate. Similarly, writer Ida Tarbell exposed the senior Rockefeller as a ruthless robber baron and President Theodore Roosevelt included him among the malefactors of great wealth. At the time of Nelson Rockefeller's birth on July 8th of 1908, both of his grandfathers were afflicted by negative publicity. Senator Aldrich withdrew from politics in 1911, while John D. Rockefeller Sr. hired one of the first public relations specialists to reshape his public image into that of a kindly old gentleman handing shiny dimes to children. Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller inherited both a vast family fortune and a family image that he had to live down in order to achieve his political ambitions because even as a little boy he wanted to be president of the United States after all he reasoned when you think of what I had what else was there to aspire to the third of five brothers Nelson was the energetic outgoing leader within his own family he and his brothers grew up in the family home on West 54th Street in New York, which was so filled with art that his parents bought the townhouse next door just to house their collection. Eventually, the Rockefellers gave the property to the Museum of Modern Art. Nelson attended the progressive Lincoln School of Teachers College at Columbia University, but dyslexia hindered his schooling and prevented him from attending Princeton. With the help of tutors, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth in 1930. Shortly thereafter, 
he married Mary Todd Hunter Clark, known as Todd, whose calm reserve seemed to balance his boundless enthusiasms. After a round-the-world honeymoon, they settled in New York, and Nelson went to work for the family business. Nelson Rockefeller proved so successful in renting out space in the newly constructed Rockefeller Center that his father made him president of the center. He earned negative publicity after he ordered the removal from Rockefeller Center of murals painted by the noted Mexican artist Diego Rivera, which contained a heroic Lenin and a villainous looking J.P. Morgan. Otherwise, Rockefeller won high praise for his executive abilities. He became a director of the Creole Petroleum Company, a Rockefeller subsidiary in Venezuela. He learned Spanish and began a lifelong interest in Latin American affairs. Art was another of his passions, and during the Depression, he served as treasurer of the Museum of Modern Art. In 1939, he became the museum's president, encountering such intense infighting that he boasted, I learned my politics at the Museum of Modern Art. In 1940, President Franklin Roosevelt appointed the 32-year-old Rockefeller to the new post of coordinator of the Office of Inter-American Affairs. It was a shrewd move on Rock Roosevelt's part, designed to mute the Rockefeller family support of Wendell Wilkie for president that year. Although his brother served in uniform, Nelson held civilian posts throughout World War II, becoming assistant secretary of state for American Republic's affairs in 1944. He played a key role in hemispheric policy at the United Nations Conference held in San Francisco, developing consensus for regional pacts, such as the Rio Pact and NATO, within the UN's framework. Although President Roosevelt tried to lure Rockefeller into the Democratic Party, he remained loyal to his family's Republican ties. When Roosevelt died, his successor showed less appreciation for Rockefeller's talents. In August of 1945, the failed haberdasher Harry Truman fired the multimillionaire Rockefeller in order to settle dispute within the State Department. Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller represented a larger-than-life figure in American history who achieved nearly every prize he desired except the one he most sought, the presidency. As an heir to one of the largest family fortunes in America, Rockefeller funded many philanthropic projects. As a special counsel to six presidents, he helped to shape U.S. foreign and domestic policy. As four-time governor of New York State, he promoted major social and political reforms. During these decades of public philanthropy and political service, Rockefeller pursued the office of the presidency. Ironically, after three unsuccessful attempts to become president, as well as his legendary disdain to be second in anything, Rockefeller accepted President Gerald Ford's offer to become the 41st Vice President of the United States. Rockefeller's term as Vice President held many trials and triumphs. Despite his political savvy and ability to manage people, Rockefeller faced numerous challenges. He encountered a highly controversial and lengthy confirmation process for the Vice Presidency. He experienced the emotionally draining conflicts fostered among competing interests in the Ford White House and endured the overwhelming demands placed on him as both vice president and staff assistant to the president. Having survived these challenges, Rockefeller succeeded 
and making the vice presidency more substantively involved in the policy processes of the contemporary presidency. Given the fact that the, he neither sought nor wanted the vice presidency, he took an office that is often considered virtually useless and propelled it into a position that initiated and developed policy proposals that had far-reaching consequences for the country. Furthermore, he lent a sense of energy to a presidential administration that might well have languished in the aftermath of Watergate, if not for him. Born in Bar Harbor, Maine in 1908, Rockefeller was a third-generation heir to the name and fortune of the Rockefellers. In fact, both sides of his family had attained prestige and wealth. Maternal grandfather Nelson Aldrich became a self-made millionaire and was a respected majority leader in the U.S. Senate for 17 years. Paternal grandfather John D. Rockefeller had formed the Standard Oil Corporation and by 1908 had seized control of nearly every aspect of oil production in the United States. As a result of this, John D. had become what President Theodore Roosevelt labeled a malefactor of great wealth. Rockefeller lived with his parents and five siblings in several of their family homes, including a townhouse in New York City and a country estate in Pocantico Hills, Westchester. Or Pocantico Hills. Uh, it's in Westchester, New York. Despite the magnificence of these homes, complete with art treasures, family infirmaries, and private playgrounds, Rockefeller's father instilled in him many of the traditional values that his father had taught him. Frugality and altruism being primary among them. When Rockefeller received his allowance of 30 cents a week at age 8, his father allowed him to spend only 10 cents on himself, with the remainder to be split equally between savings and charity. And like his grandfather, Rockefeller became an adept at making money. As a young boy, he raised rabbits to be sold to the Rockefeller Institute raised vegetables that he sold to the family kitchen, and performed household chores for money. Both his mother and his father wanted their son to respect the physical and financial benefits of hard work. Rockefeller found his formal education, especially in the early years, to be difficult due to left-handedness and dyslexia. In the early 1900s, Many people considered left-handedness an aberration. To counter this abnormality in his son, Rockefeller's father would inflict a mild pain by snapping an elastic band on his son's right hand when Nelson used his left hand. Although he became right-handed in most activities, this conversion process probably intensified his learning disability. Rockefeller transposed numbers and juxtaposed letters and words. These problems nearly caused him to fail the ninth grade and placed him in his high school classes bottom third. While his grades prevented him from attending Princeton University like his older brother, he remained undaunted. Working tirelessly and with unflinching perseverance, and confident to the point of cockiness in his own abilities, Rockefeller improved his grades enough to allow him to enter Dartmouth College in 1926. Rockefeller's college years helped to crystallize his beliefs and character. First, his experience with fraternities, which he considered snobbish, made him more aware of the need to promote democratic institutions and to consider the welfare of people not as privileged as himself. Second, college became an arena for Rockefeller to face tough competition and to experience both defeat and victory. In a foreshadowing of later events, he lost the class presidency 
and became instead the class vice president. His first political upset, however, did not prevent him from achieving success as a scholar. Rockefeller's senior thesis, a 45-page essay on Standard Oil, earned him an A, and the respect of his teachers, fellow students, and family. In addition, it gave him greater insight into the power and the consequent responsibility of the Rockefellers. In 1930, he earned membership in Phi Beta Kappa and graduated cum laude. Less than a month after graduation, Rockefeller married Mary Todd Hunter Clark, whom he had courted during his school vacations. Nicknamed Todd, she also had come from a distinguished family. Her family's estate in Philadelphia had been granted to them by their ancestor, King George III, and her maternal grandfather had served as president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. During their 31-year marriage, Todd, woman possessing a keen intelligence, wit, and the requisite social graces, gave birth to five children. After an around-the-world honeymoon lasting nine months, which included appointments with business associates and foreign leaders at every stop, Rockefeller and his wife returned to New York City in 1931. Despite the depression, he had his choice of business opportunities. He quickly became bored with a minor post at Standard Oil and so went to work with his uncle at Chase Bank. During the morning, Rockefeller learned the banking business and in the afternoon devoted his energy to a company he started, Special Work Incorporated. Its mission involved finding tenants for the new Rockefeller Center, then the world's largest office complex. Rockefeller excelled at leasing space and at public relations for the center. He frequently made the news with special ceremonies and speeches that paid tribute to the opulent structure. He proved so successful in the promotion of Rockefeller Center that his father named him its executive vice president in 1937 and its president in 1938. One year later, Rockefeller became more involved with his second love, art. Having acquired a genuine appreciation for fine art from his mother, he eagerly accepted the position of president of the Museum of Modern Art. It was, however, a small investment that Rockefeller made in the Creole Petroleum Company, CPC, in 1935, a Venezuelan subsidiary of Standard Oil that altered the course of his life. After becoming a member of the CBC Board of Directors, he recruited a group of oil and economic experts to accompany him on a fact-finding mission to Latin America. He discovered that the U.S. executives of the Venezuelan CBC chose not to learn, learn the native tongue, managed the company autocratically, and even separated themselves from the workers with barbed wire fences. Thanks to Rockefeller's report to the CBC Board of Directors on his return to the United States, the company instituted major reforms to serve better the interests of the host country. Rockefeller also took note of the growing anti-U.S. sentiment being created by companies like the CPC and the cultivation of that negative sentiment by German, Japanese, Italian, and Soviet agents. If these were left unchecked, he believed, Latin America would fall prey to the Axis powers and lead ultimately to the ruin of the Rockefeller interests and those of the United States. Rockefeller's fervent interest in Latin America brought him to the attention of President Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt wanted him to head a program that would strengthen Latin American ties to the United States. After clearing it with his family, Rockefeller headed the office of the coordinator 
for Inter-American Affairs, the CIAA, in 1940, earning a salary of $1 a year, working long hours every day, as well as emerging relatively unscathed from bureaucratic infighting, Rockefeller made this small office one of the most popular agencies to work for during World War II, earning for himself a notoriety evidenced by his picture on the cover of Life magazine in 1942. Thanks to him, Latin American commodities were purchased at higher than market prices by the United States and other allied countries, which in turn caused critical shortages for the Axis powers. U.S. companies in Latin America were forced to terminate their anti-U.S. agents or be blacklisted by the State Department, and the CIAA's information campaign involving newspapers, radio, and movies met and turned back the tide of Nazi propaganda in Latin America. Roosevelt, impressed and pleased with Rockefeller's accomplishments, appointed him Assistant Secretary of State for American Republic Affairs in 1944. As Assistant Secretary, he lobbied successfully to have the fascist the fascist ruled Argentina admitted to the United Nations and reinforced the Monroe Doctrine by maneuvering the United Nations into agreeing that aggression against one American region was equivalent to aggression against all of the Americas. Despite his accomplishments, Rockefeller's appointment as Assistant Secretary came to an end eight months after the death of Roosevelt. President Harry S. Truman felt no strong loyalty to Rockefeller, and when Truman's newly appointed Secretary of State wanted to choose his own assistant, the president gladly accepted Rockefeller's resignation in 1945. Returning to New York, Rockefeller again took control of Rockefeller Center. Unsatisfied and eager, once again to command global attention, he launched the American International Association, the AIA, in 1946, a nonprofit and philanthropic, philanthropic organization designed to aid in the modernization of Brazil's and Venezuela's health, education, and agricultural infrastructure. Over time, the AIA helped to build roads and reduce infant mortality. In conjunction with the AIA, Rockefeller also started the International Basic Economy Corporation, the, I, A, uh, the IBEC, in 1947, a private commercial organization whose mission was to introduce Latin America to such U.S. enterprises as supermarkets and mass distribution. As a result of the IBEC, Hundreds of U.S. businesses invested in Latin America. So I apologize for my voice, guys. Uh, I, like I said, I'm battling uh, being sick here. I have a sore throat, congested. I'm sure you can probably hear it in my voice. Uh, and my voice is really struggling right now. So I know I usually mispronounce words, and that sort of thing. But uh, my voice is really giving me some problems today. So... I apologize. Please bear with me. Uh, this is not my usual sounding voice, as you guys know, so I apologize. Rockefeller's private ventures regarding cultural and technological progress in Latin America again gained him entry into the White House. In 1949, President Truman announced his Point Four program to introduce scientific advances into underdeveloped areas. With some prodding by Rockefeller, Truman invited him in 1950 to chair the International Advisory Board, the IAB, to enact that program. The board's recommendation to consolidate all overseas economic functions currently distributed among 23 agencies into a single office the Office of Overseas Economic Administration antagonized Special Assistant to the President, Avril Harriman. 
Harriman wanted an organization that stressed military rather than economic assistance in Latin America. When Truman approved the Harriman Agency, Rockefeller resigned from the IAB in 1951. When the Republican Party regained the White House a year later with the election of Dwight Eisenhower, Rockefeller again seized the opportunity to return to Washington. He enjoyed much success in the Eisenhower administration. As chair of an advisory committee to study the reorganization of the federal government, Rockefeller helped establish the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, and in 1953 became its first undersecretary. His position, which involved improving health and educational facilities, soon gave way to yet another coveted position in 1953, special assistant to the president concerning foreign affairs. In this role, Rockefeller developed programs that would increase understanding and cooperation among countries. The media popularly termed his work psychological warfare. Rockefeller persuaded Eisenhower to adopt the plan proposed to him by his consultant, Harvard professor of government, Henry Kissinger. Called Open Skies, the Rockefeller-Kissinger plan not only proposed that the United States and the Soviet Union allow inspectors from each country to examine military establishments as a necessary step to nuclear disarmament, but it also proposed that both countries allow aerial inspections of their territories to reduce the risk of surprise attacks. Rockefeller again waited for recognition of his service by being appointed to a cabinet post and was again disappointed. Frustrated, Rockefeller resigned and left Washington in 1955. From his experiences in the Eisenhower White House, he recognized the limitations of being in someone else's power and now sought the power that derives from being popularly elected. With the announcement of his candidacy for governor in 1958, Rockefeller staged an aggressive and expensive media campaign that highlighted his dedication to work diligently for the public welfare. This, coupled with his inherent charm, won him the governorship of New York for the first of four times. During his 15 years as New York governor, Rockefeller achieved an impressive record of accomplishments. To tackle the urban problems of the state, he created the Urban Development Corporation to clear slum areas and aid in the construction of low-income housing. His anti-drug program initially opposed from most, almost all quarters due to the harsh penalties Rockefeller called for was eventually instituted with only minor changes. Regarding education, he expanded the New York State University system to the point that it was the largest system of higher education anywhere in the world at that time. He successfully pushed for legislation that outlawed racial discrimination in housing and the lending practices of financial institutions. His youth centers served to provide training and jobs for troubled young adults. He also promoted construction on a grand scale. To make Albany worth, worthy of being the capital of New York, Rockefeller initiated the South Mall Project. By its completion, the Empire State Plaza had been constructed and constituted an 18-acre complex of government buildings, a cultural center, and a shopping mall. To attract industry and business, Rockefeller oversaw the building of the twin 110-story towers of the World Trade Center. Other benefits New Yorkers received because of Governor Rockefeller included a state council on the arts that promoted cultural development in the performing arts, 
establishment of the first mandatory police training course, and the development of open land as a recreational areas. Rockefeller's terms as governor were not without their moments of controversy. Perhaps the most dra dramatic involved the Attica prison riot in September 1971 and Rockefeller's response to it. For five days, inmates seized control of the prison, taking 39 guards hostage. Despite repeated pleading by the prison commissioner and others on the scene, Rockefeller refused to come to Attica personally. He did, however, order the state police to retake the prison. In the assault, 39 inmates and hostage hostages were killed, constituting the highest loss of life in U.S. penal history. The McKay Commission, authorized to study the riot and its aftermath, criticized both the amount of force used in retaking the prison and Rockefeller's failure to appear on the scene and take charge personally. His triumphs and trials as governor, however, did not slow his drive for achieving his most sought-after goal, the presidency. Reputation as a spender Rockefeller returned to government during Dwight Eisenhower's administration, where he chaired a committee on government organization, became undersecretary of the new Department of Health, Education and Welfare, served as special assistant to the president for Cold War strategy, and headed the secret 40 committee, a group of high government officials who were charged with overseeing the CIA's clandestine operations. He was slated for a high-level post in the Department of Defense until fiscally conservative Secretary of the Treasury George Humphrey vetoed Rockefeller as a spender. Rockefeller returned to New York, determined to establish his own political career. In 1958, he challenged the popular and prestigious governor, Avril Harriman, in what the press dubbed the Battle of the Millionaires. Rockefeller campaigned as a man of the people, appearing in shirt sleeves and eating his way through the ethnic, ethnic foods of New York neighborhoods. His victory in a year when Republicans lost badly elsewhere made him an overnight contender for the Republican presidential nomination in 1960. Republicans who distrusted Vice President Richard Nixon rallied to Rockefeller, and Democrats like Senator John F. Kennedy considered him the most formidable candidate that the Republicans might nominate. Because, Rockef <coughs> excuse me. because Rockefeller's advisors were reluctant to have him enter the party primaries, however, he was never able to demonstrate his popular appeal or overcome Nixon's lead among party loyalists. Instead, Rockefeller used his clout to summon Nixon to his Fifth Avenue apartment and dictate terms for a more liberal party platform. Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater denounced this event as the Munich of the Republican Party, the beginning of a long estrangement between Rockefeller and the Republican right. Nixon's defeat in 1960 made Rockefeller the frontrunner for the Republican nomination in 1964. But between the two elections, he stunned the nation by divorcing his wife of 32 years and marrying a younger woman, Margareta Fittler Murphy, better known as Happy. She was the recently divorced wife of an executive in the Rockefeller Medical Institute. The birth of their son, Nelson Jr., on the eve of the Republican primary in California, reminded voters of the remarriage and contributed to Rockefeller's loss to Goldwater. At the party's convention in San Francisco, Goldwater's delegates loudly booed Rockefeller when he tried to speak. To them, 
he embodied the hated Eastern liberal establishment. Rockefeller sat out the election, an act that further branded him as a spoiler. These are people who have nothing in common with Americanism. The Republican Party must repudiate these people. An impressive record as governor. Unsuccessful in his presidential bids, Rockefeller achieved a more impressive record as governor. He was a master builder, overseeing highway construction, the expansion of the state university system, and the erection of a vast new complex of state office buildings in Albany. Although New Yorkers joked about their governor's edifice complex, they elected him to four terms. To pay for his many projects without raising taxes excessively, Rockefeller consulted the prominent municipal bond specialist John Mitchell, later Attorney General under Richard Nixon, who advised the creation of quasi-independent agencies that could issue bonds. The State University Construction Fund would repay its bonds through tuition and fees, while other agencies would build roads, public housing, and hospitals. As a result, control of a large part of the budget and of state operations shifted from the legislature to the governor. It was later revealed during Rockefeller's vice presidential confirmation hearings that he had also made personal financial contributions to the chairman of these independent agencies, thereby reinforcing their loyalty to the governor. In perpetual motion, Governor Rockefeller tackled one project after another. He waded into campaigning with similar gusto, shaking hands and giving his famous greeting, Hiya, fella. He laced his speeches with superlatives and platitudes and so often repeated the phrase, the brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. That reporter shortened it to create the acronym BOMFOG or bomb fog. Although he campaigned as a man of the people, he lived in a different world. When AIDS proposed a plan for the state to take over state employee contributions to Social Security in order to increase their take home pay, Rockefeller asked, What is take home pay? A staunch anti-communist, Rockefeller never opposed the war in Vietnam, explaining that he did not, that did not want to offend President Lyndon Johnson and risk cuts in federal aid to New York. In 1968, Johnson tried to convince Rockefeller to run for president. He told me he could not sleep at night if Nixon was president, and he wasn't all that sure about Hubert Humphrey either. Rockefeller later revealed. The governor responded that he had promised his wife not to run again, but Johnson insisted, let me talk to Happy, and took her off in the White House to apply some of his, some of his famed personal persuasion. They came back a half hour later, Rockefeller recalled, and Lyndon said, I've talked her into letting you run. Rockefeller announced his candidacy, but Nixon's powerful campaign apparatus rolled over him. When Humphrey became the Democratic nominee, he invited Rockefeller to run as his vice president. I turned him down, Rockefeller said. Franklin Roosevelt wanted me to be a Democrat back in the 1940s. It was too late. Despite an inability to hide his personal disdain for Richard Nixon, Rockefeller campaigned for Nixon in both 1968 and 1972. He admired Nixon's tough stands in Vietnam and Cambodia. Shaped by National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger, who originally had served as Rockefeller's foreign policy advisor. Nixon appointed Rockefeller to serve on the Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board 
to oversee CIA activities. Meanwhile, Rockefeller's own politics were shifting toward the right, partly to make peace with conservative Republicans who had vilified him, and partly in response to the so-called conservative backlash of the late 1960s. Rockefeller's tough law and order stand during the Attica prison riots in 1971 further diminished his liberal image. The governor refused demands of rioting prisoners at the state penitentiary that he, that he negotiate with them in person and instead sent in state troops, resulting in the deaths of many inmates and their captives. At the Republican convention in 1972, Rockefeller nominated Nixon. After the election, as Nixon sank into the Watergate scandal, Rockefeller steadfastly resisted attacking him while he was down. So that pretty much leads us up to the vice presidency. Uh, there's a couple more things I'll touch on in part two, but um, a couple things here just about his early life. Rockefeller was born on July 8th of 1908 at 12.10 p.m. in Bar Harbor, Maine. Named Nelson Aldrich after his maternal grandfather, Nelson W. Aldrich, he was the second son and third child of financier and philanthropist John Davison Rockefeller Jr. and philanthropist and socialite Abigail Abby Aldrich. He had two older siblings, siblings Abby and John III, as well as three younger brothers, Lawrence, Winthrop, and David. Their father, John Jr., was the only son of Standard Oil co-founder John D. Rockefeller and schoolteacher Laura Spellman. Their mother, Abby, was a daughter of Senator Nelson Wilmarth Aldridge and Abigail P. Green. Rockefeller grew up in his family's homes in New York City, mainly at 10 West 54th Street, a country home in Pocantico or Pocantico Hills, uh, New York, uh, and a summer home in Seal Harbor, Maine. The family also traveled widely. He received his elementary, middle, and high school education at Lincoln School in New York City, an experimental school administered by Teachers College of Columbia University and funded by the Rockefeller family. Nelson was also known to disappear on the way to school and was once found exploring the city's sewer system. As a child, he was the indisputable leader of his brothers, becoming particularly close to Lawrence. Although his parents saw potential for Nelson's succeed in life, he was a poor student. Generally in the lower third of his class, he almost failed ninth grade and had undiagnosed dyslexia. Nelson's biographer, Joseph E. Persico, wrote that as a child, he demonstrated a discipline that throughout life would serve him in lieu of brilliance. Although Nelson wasn't accepted into Princeton, he got into Dartmouth arriving on campus in 1926. While in college, he met Mary Todd Hunter Clark at their summer home in Maine, and the two fell in love. They were engaged in autumn of 1929, and in 1930 he graduated cum laude with an A.B. degree in economics from Dartmouth, where he was a member of Casca and Gauntlet, a senior society. Phi Beta Kappa in Psi Upsilon. Upsilon. Rockefeller and Mary were married where, after he graduated on June 23, 1930 at Bala Sinwid. I, th I think it's Bala, Bala Sinwid, Pennsylvania. Um, or maybe it's Bala. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's in Lower Marion Township, so it's not far from uh, Pennsylvania. I am from Philadelphia, I should say. And then we know about his early career... Uh, coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, the CIAA. We know all that. So we went into all that. I'm not going to go back over all that stuff. Um, so that's pretty much it. That leads us right up to his time as being elected, or I should say being appointed, not elected, being appointed vice president. So 
Part two tomorrow, we'll get into his vice presidency, his legacy, some more about what he uh, did in his political career, and then, of course, his death and the very mysterious gravesite of Nelson Rockefeller, a vice president gravesite I have not technically visited. I've been close. I've probably been within 50 yards or so, but not technically visited. So stay tuned for that tomorrow in part two. Thank you so much, guys, for your patience. Thank you for the support. I know it's been uh, about 10 days or so since we posted. I appreciate it. Sorry I'm battling through this cold. Sorry it sounds a little funny, but I hope you enjoyed this part one and this look at the early life and early political rise of our 41st Vice President of the United States, Nelson Rockefeller. Thanks so much, guys. We will see you tomorrow for part two. See you then. Bye-bye now.